When Joe Biden first announced his 2020 bid, some wondered where a candidate like him might fit into the Me Too era. Some praised his advocacy for the Violence Against Women Act, among other things. Others, though, raised concerns about his conduct during the Clarence Thomas hearings in particular. There's also some history of his alleged touching inappropriately of close contact with women. D.C. Bureau Chief of the Intercept Ryan Grimm, he just wrote about Tara Reid. She's a woman who came forward with allegations against the former vice president to the organization Time's Up. Now, according to Ryan, they refused to investigate her allegations due to concerns over its nonprofit status and Biden's presidential run. Dr Ryan joins us now via Skype to explain a little bit more. Ryan, just before we get started, this morning we actually reached out to multiple representatives from the Biden campaign, and we have not yet received a single response, which seems to comport with what uh, they declined to comment to you as well. Just break the story down here, because it seems it, it can seem a little bit complicated, but it really is a stunning cover-up, if that's what it amounts to, of the inter interconnectedness of the Time's Up organization, the Biden campaign, and an effort by moneyed establishment to protect Joe Biden from this allegation. Well, you know, it's interesting to kind of think of it from um, her perspective as she's, you know, seeking uh, a way to, to come forward. So to back up, you know, in, in 2019, when Lucy Flores uh, made her allegation against Joe Biden that he had kind of sniffed her hair, uh, kissed the back of her head in an inappropriate way, like right before she went on stage to, to speak at an event in 2014 in Nevada, uh, you know, she was attacked as a, a, a Bernie supporter who was blowing it out of proportion and, and, you know, using it for political gain. And so at that time, Tara Reid uh, came forward to her local paper saying that, you know, he did very similar stuff to me when I worked in his office, you know, in the early 90s, and he did it in front of people. And, it, and it's absurd that that people wouldn't believe that this happens. We, you know, we've seen him do this sort of thing on on video. Like, why are you attacking Flores credibility? You know, so at, at that moment, you know, she got uh, a ton of blowback online. And for, you know, for normal citizens who aren't used to this kind of thing, it, it can be extraordinarily overwhelming. And so she went silent for a number of months. And in, in January, she reached out to the organization Time's Up, said she wanted to con continue speaking publicly and went through a number of conversations uh, with with people there. Uh, they referred her to some attorneys. They told me they're still very willing to continue to refer her to attorneys and provide her assistance that way. But they have a fund. You know, they raised more than $20 million at the height of the Me Too movement, and they're using that money you know, to support uh, legal bills and to pay, f you know, fund the PR of, of women who have accusations against uh, powerful people. They told her, you know, on second thought, we can't we can't actually help you uh, because the person you're accusing is running for federal office and we're a tax exempt nonprofit and that would put our status uh, at risk. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're then <laughs> so she's kind of stuck at that point. Um, and so over the course of the next several weeks, she, she reached out to people who might have contacts in the media, and one of them eventually kind of brought her to me. Mm -hmm. And Ryan, you allude in your story to, okay, so she raised um, these certain concerns sort of consistent with the treatment that Lucy Flores um, said she was subjected to by Joe Biden, but that there was another part of the story that she wanted to tell. Did, did Tara speak to you about that other part of the story? Yeah, she did. We we didn't include that in our uh, original story. You know, s pieces like that take you know an extraordinary amount of uh, vetting, verification, um, background reporting. Uh, wh whereas uh, this this the story about Times Up was rather straightforward because uh, Times Up confirmed to me, you know, on the record that this is what they told her that the. Um, that they consider them that they are a, non, a tax exempt nonprofit, and they consider taking a case against a federal candidate um, to be uh, out of bounds. You know, I talked to a number of nonprofit lawyers, one of whom is uh, quoted, or tax tax lawyers, who one of whom is quoted in the story, saying that that's just not a reasonable interpretation of the law. You know, if 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 you're an organization that is set up to defend women, you know, who have accusations against um, against people in male dominated industries then you can carry forward with your mission whether or not one of those people files to run for federal office. You know, they don't they don't get a get out of jail free card just because they ran for federal office. You know, as long as your criteria is consistent and standard and you can and you can demonstrate that, then you're completely in the clear when it comes to 
tax exempt status. And what this would do is it would say if if you were harassed or assaulted by President Donald Trump, by any member of the House of Representatives who was running for reelection, which is ninety nine percent of them, um, or or anybody in the United States Senate who has filed for reelection, which is almost all of them, um, then then we can't take your case, which you know rules out you know some of the most powerful men uh, in, in the world. Right, that just seems patently absurd. And one of the other things, Ryan, that you haven't gotten to yet is the intertwinement of the Biden campaign itself with the Times Up, uh, with Times Up organization. Can you go into that and Anita Dunn's role in particular? Yeah, for, for and again, from her perspective, you can only imagine, you know, if she's uh, googling around the the Times Up website to see, okay, they offer they offer public relations help. That's wonderful. Um, let's see who you know who does the public relations work for for Time's Up. And there it is right on their website. Oh, it's it's this uh, powerhouse Democratic firm in Washington, D.C. known as SKD Knickerbocker. Like, oh, wait a minute. That name that name is familiar. Oh, that's Anita Dunn's firm. And, you know, and Anita Dunn has effectively been um, Joe Biden's uh, campaign manager. Uh, so, you know, just tr- trying to, you know, come to that organization with, you know, it, it's it's as if she was um, she had she had a claim against the absolute worst person that she could have right. uh, if she were coming coming to this particular organization, given given the, the various links. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And did Anita Dunn, did, did they comment to you? Did they have any response to any of this? So they they referred questions back to the National Women's Law Center, uh, which is the the nonprofit that houses the Time's Up. National uh, Defense Fund. Uh, so no, not in, not in particular. Yeah, I mean, you can see through all of this um, from Tara's perspective. I mean, first, what she does come forward with, she's smeared and attacked online by prominent people, frankly, um, for coming forward with those claims. Then the one organization that is supposed to be there for, you know, alleged victims like her, alleged survivors like her, declines to help her out. You can see why so many women decide not to come forward. Um, and they, you can also see how it's so hard to report out these pieces because ultimately, you know, she knows what happens and he knows what happens, but it's very hard to find corroboration. Does she have any sort of supporting corroboration for the additional claims that she's making? So at the time that uh, it happened, she spoke to, um, you know, she told her mother about it. She told her, her best friend who worked in Senator Kennedy's office, and she, she told her brother about it. Um, her, her mother has since passed away. Uh, her brother uh, recalls talking to her about it and recalls that her, you know, well, also recalls what her mother's reaction was um, and her and her friend as well, uh, who she's still friends with today, you know, re- recalls it. So in, in the context of uh, the verification that we look for in Me Too stories in, in the kind of post Me Too era, you know, she she has the she has those pieces. She can also you know, quite plainly verify that she did, in fact, work for um, the, the Biden office in the in the early 90s um, and that she would have you know been in the places that uh, that she says. Now, uh, like you said, you know, there for a lot of these encounters, there there are no witnesses. Um, and so it becomes a, a he said, she said, which is why uh, whether or not someone talked about it contemporaneously uh, two people and those people um, are credible and will and and are willing to talk. You know, matters in, in the in the course of you know further kind of verifying these mm-hmm. these allegations or at least you know establishing a baseline level of credibility for them. Right. And Ryan, I want to underscore one more thing, which is with Times Up in particular, is that this organization took millions of dollars, was touted by celebrities and by so much of the Democratic establishment as the, you know, this is the clearinghouse for so many of these cases. And yet, whenever it comes to intersect with the Biden campaign, that's when so much, that's when their tune essentially starts to change. And really, like you said, defeat the purpose of setting it up in the first place if it's supposed to help women bring cases against powerful men. And yet, under their definition to protect Biden, in also happens to protect every elected official in the country. Yeah, you know, and they may end up, uh, you know, rethinking this this policy as they hear. And this is the first time the policy has been made public, so I'm sure that you know, yesterday afternoon and, and today they're 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 hearing from allies who are saying, look, you know, this is this is not a reasonable interpretation of of tax law. Like I, I'll I'll give you 
uh, a dozen tax attorneys who will tell you that there's that there's nothing that's stopping you. Uh, you know, don't 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 make it look as if uh, because the irony here would be that the the tax law uh, the argument is that you know the the taxpayer should not be subsidi- subsidizing an organization to participate in electioneering, uh, and that's that, that's that's a reasonable tax law as far as I'm concerned. But you know you could also make the argument that by not taking cases like this one, they're also in a way participating in influencing um, an election season. You know, if she had come forward in January, maybe um, you know that it matters whether she came forward in January rather than uh, r- rather than March. So I think that they're going to hear from allies and probably people internally who also were not aware of this policy and will say, you know, let's th- this this is not this is not accurate and all. You know, it's also interesting that, you know, they so they raised more than twenty four million dollars on on GoFundMe. Uh, you'd have to talk to a tax attorney ab- about this. But, you know, millions of those dollars were were contributed by people who were not looking for a tax deduction. Mm, you know, right. they, they, they just gave, they gave their fifty dollars. They gave their hundred dollars and they were happy to support the cause. And they did not right. then t- tell the IRS, hey, uh, you know, take take one hundred dollars off my tax bill because I gave money here. Um, so for donors like that to then learn that there are these guardrails being put around money because it's tax exempt when they weren't even looking for a tax benefit, um, is, you know, probably disturbing to a lot of those, those donors. Yeah. Well, and I think your point is well taken that the decision to take the case may impact an election. The decision not to take a case may impact an election. So either way, Um, You're having an impact here. It seems to me patently absurd to rule out the ability to um, support women who, you know, are making allegations against any man who happens to hold elected office and be seeking Mm. re-election. Seems to me ridiculous, but lawyers will have to weigh in on that one more. Ryan, thank you so much. Thanks, Ryan. Great to have you. You got it. Next on Rising, nationwide closures of restaurants, bars, and hotels will leave millions unemployed. The international president of Unite Here, a service industry union, joins us now to explain the repercussions. That's next.